All right, we'll go ahead and get started with uh, dispensations. Again, now we are looking at, uh, yeah, we're actually looking at the dispensations at this point. So we're looking, uh, we're going to start with the first dispensation, which the first dispensation, of course, can be found in Genesis. It's just after the creation stories. Um, we're going to have, well, primarily in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, you actually have the fall where it's being uh, spoken about. So um, we are in the Garden of Eden. Remember that is where God actually chose to put uh, Adam and Eve at this point. Uh, he created a garden in Eve or in Eden, which we find you know that Eden is a reference to the earth. And the household rules are given um, to Abraham or Abraham to Adam at this point. Let's get the right uh, person there. Um, and in Genesis chapter two verse seventeen it says, "But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, or you will not eat. For in the day in which you eat, you will." And then most of our translations say, "Surely die," but it's actually uh, the word "dying" is twice. It's uh, dying, you will die. Uh, I mean, looking at that, by the way, without knowledge of the New Testament, that in and of itself does not state that we have two deaths in Genesis. That would be reading too much into the text. Uh, we do get a concept of dying that you will die, and when you understand, especially the way this is being used, um, this particular structure because it is used in Hebrew in other areas in the Hebrew language. Uh, one of them is with a man who was told that um, by King David, if he crosses over a river, dying he will die. Now he didn't die the second he crossed over that river, but when and it was quite a bit later, but when it was found out that he did, they came and they put him to death because he was told, you do this, you will die. If you don't, you will live. So as soon as he crossed over, he was dead, even though he was actually alive. So they use the same construction here, which we're going to see, of course, as soon as Adam ate from the tree, did they physically drop dead? No, they didn't. But they were dead. And, and you can even look at this from a perspective of uh, spiritual death. From that point on, spiritual death was no question. It was coming. Uh, physical death along with it is what I mean. Um, but New Testament gives us an understanding that there is a, an, an, there's really two deaths that happen at this point. So over in Romans chapter 5 it talks about that. Um, Romans chapter 5 and verse 15, here is um, the area where it's talking about death. And it says, but the but not as the trespass, thus also the gracious gift. For since by the trespass of the one man, the many died, how much more the grace from God and the gift by grace, by the one man, Jesus Christ, abounds unto many. Now, of course, uh, in that passage and in the rest of Romans, especially in uh, chapter 5, verses 13 through 14, we have the distinction of two deaths kind of laid out for us. Uh, and starting in verse 13, well really actually we can back up to 12, in Romans chapter 5 verse 12, because of this, just as through one man the sin entered the world, and through the sin the death. Uh, now in, if you're following in context of what that's referencing, that death is referring to physical death. Physical death entered in through sin. And that was passed on to all men on the basis that all sinned. Um, and we see that it wasn't related to the law, because in verse 13, for until the law was in the world, uh, sin, well, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed, being no law. So up to the law, mankind was still dying, but it wasn't because they broke the law, because there was no law at that point. Uh, it was because of the sin that, it had, that Adam had done. And then, of course, in verse 15, we get a different death, and this is from a trespass. You know, and of course, that's a good passage to understand because we have the distinction between um, a death that comes from sin and a death that comes from a trespass. You know, and when we understand the trespass and the trespass becomes before a death, you can't, you can't say those are the same deaths. It, it wouldn't make any sense. 
in the context. So ultimately that's what's happening back over here in Genesis where we're getting this reference as he's saying, if you do this, dying you will die. Um, this is law. We have a do not. Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this uh, knowledge of good and evil is that which is beneficial and that which is uh, raw, which is good, could be considered, I mean, it's typically your word for evil, but it can also have the idea of calamity or bad. Um, don't quite have as good of distinctions with words in the Hebrew as we do with the Greek. Um, so, in this case, it kind of covers a little bit more. Uh, other instructions are given to them, but they're not related to law, and they're not related to the conduct of the household. Uh, this particular one is conduct of the household. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15, there's a reference to them tending to the garden. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. So he was responsible for maintaining the garden. And that was kind of his task to do. Um, very, uh, that, that actually does show an interesting thing about life, especially in this kind of a situation. Adam wasn't just left to just wander around and do nothing and hang out all day. He, he had a task, and um, more than likely it was very, you get up, you do this, this, and this, and you know, he was very uh, processed and ordered. Because we see that actually with God even in heaven. When the angels are presented before the before God, they come in an, in a very orderly fashion at an appointed time. You know, it, it's done in proper order, and there's no reason to think Adam wouldn't be doing that too. In 128, um, he is. They are told to fill the earth. Um, God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So they are instructed to not only multiply and fill the earth, but also to rule over all of the animals and sea life at this point. Uh, mankind does not eat them at this point, by the way. Um, mankind is a, is a vegetarian. Um, now, you know, as far as being a vegetarian, yes, it's a great thing, but if you're really going to be a vegetarian, you want what they had. Because they had the kind of vegetables that probably tasted good. You know, and, uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, they had stuff that sustained you. Where ours, you know, it, it, it's difficult to get something to sustain you. I never really fully got the concept of why a vegetarian would want to make something that looks like meat and tastes like meat. <laughs> but isn't meat. I'm like, why don't you just eat meat? You know, and... They really want meat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like, just can't they it. really yeah. want it, but, and then there's the nutritional part where they got to use all these supplements now because we just don't have the kind of fruits and vegetables that they had. Um, and God, of course, does change that, as we'll see. But at this point, this ruling over them um, doesn't involve um, eating them at all. Mankind, at this, his uh, meat or his food is the trees that uh, yield fruit and herbs and these would be herbs that are bearing of seeds um, so you know in each dispensation we do get sometimes more information about what, what they're to do where they're to be other things along those lines but they aren't necessarily rules to the dispensation here we have a very specific rule don't eat from that one tree that's it that is the only rule he has. Yeah. Do we have any indication of how large the garden was? We do, because it talks about that with... Four rivers, right? Yeah, it talks about the four rivers and I mean, the general area. And I suppose if you mapped it out, you could probably get a general idea of the size of it. Uh, but I have not actually done that. That's um, a lot of, probably a lot of area, but one man and woman to take care of. Yeah, it may very well have been. And, or, um, or he had a lot, some physical attributes that we don't have anymore. It could be. You know, it's, it's, uh, we don't get a lot of information about stuff like that. You know, um, what exactly were they doing? 
And, and of course, that really isn't the point of, of Genesis. It's not there to give us a story of the first man. It's there to give us a really an understanding for Christians that this is why we're in the condition we are today. Because God laid down a rule, very simple rule, don't eat from that one tree, and we failed. You know, and the reality is, you put any one of us there, we're going to do the exact same thing. It's just, you know, I mean, yeah, I've heard people kind of joke, oh, I would never eat of that. It's like, yeah, but you know the end result of it now. He didn't know the end result. You know, you can't go back and impose that on there. you got to be very careful with that. Um, so Adam is then, of course, um, tested. He being the one who was given the instructions. He does, uh, as we were looking at in the qualifications for a steward, he does meet those qualifications. It is God. It is Adam. Now, granted, in this case, it's kind of easy because there's nobody else. So, you know, this is one of those where, yeah, okay, it's pretty obvious that, that Adam is the steward of the dispensation. However, the woman is then later made. So remember, when man was created, the woman was also created along with him, but she, he, God had not separated us at that point into male and female. Although he had all the other animals separated into male and female. And I think he did that on purpose for uh, Abraham's, or Abraham, I don't know, I'm stuck on Abraham, for Adam's uh, benefit. You know, because when Adam saw Eve, what did he say? He said, this is a help me. This is one who stands before me. This is the other part of me that I'm looking and I'm seeing how God has arranged everything else. This is the other part of me, the one that's for me. And he never says that she's under him. She is to stand beside him or in front of him. As far as object of salvation for this dispensation, well, mankind is innocent. So if you're in a state of innocence, do you need salvation? Salvation from what? Um, because salvation uh, really, in this case, um, when we're dealing with salvation, salvation is a, we need salvation because of sin, because of unrighteousness. He's not unrighteous at this point. However, he is not righteous either. He's innocent. So he's neither righteous nor unrighteous. And how can I say that? To be righteous, what do you have to do? You have to act right. He had nothing to act right in relation to. All he had to do was tend to the garden. And that wasn't really the restraint. Now, when it comes to a time where he is then, he has a situation where he is to act right, what does he actually do? He doesn't act right. So, but that's more of the testing. So he's untested. So really, in this dispensation, this would be the only one at this point, we do not need salvation because there is um, no failure. Not until ultimately we do actually have a failure, which is in Genesis chapter 3. And here, of course, uh, he begins to talk about the serpent, and the serpent was a beast of the field. It does describe the, the serpent quite differently from what we know serpents to be today. Um, they, are, they apparently were not only quite beautiful, but uh, um, very cunning. And I don't really, I mean, again, we're missing parts of it. It's like, cunning in what way? Were they like the ones who could manipulate you out of the best food? Or, you know, I, you know, I mean, it's just kind of what cunningness did they have in this sense? The animals aren't eating each other. We don't have death at this point. So there's no death in the world. Um, at this particular point. So it's not like uh, you could put it in that way. So the woman said to the serpent, you know, because he asks of her, uh, the fruit from the trees of the garden we made. Um, but the fruit from the tree which is in the middle of the garden, uh, God said, you shall not eat it or touch it or you will die. And as we were going over this, we did point out here, you know, this actually does even strengthen the case that Adam was the one who was the steward because Eve doesn't repeat it correctly. There's an addition to it. Um, and you know, to be honest with you, if you think about it, I, 
I don't, I mean, personally, in my mind, I, I get it now, but if I was really thinking about it, I'd probably say the same thing. Just don't go near it. Yeah. Stay away <laughs> from it. Don't touch it. Don't, you know, yeah. not really thinking that that might actually hinder somebody's understanding later. You know, um, and she, of course, does. Um, now, we do have Satan who outright lies. And he says, no, dying you will not die. You, you, you will not die. What is going to happen is you are going to become like God. Uh, but he does actually tell the truth. So he lies and he tells the truth at the same time. You know, this is one of Satan's way of manipulating things. Um, you're going to know good and evil. And that is true. We're going to know what good and evil is. And we're going to become like God in that sense. We're going to uh, have that knowledge. Unfortunately, she falls for it, and she uh, eats. Um, they are expelled as a result of this from the garden. Um, by the way, they weren't expelled because of what she did. They were expelled because of what Adam did. Adam ate intentionally. Um, I probably should have put that in the notes because it's over in First Thessalonians, and I should add that in. Not Thessalonians, Timothy, where it talks about the fact that the woman was thoroughly deceived, but Adam was not. Adam made a choice. He saw what happened to Eve. He made a choice to stay with Eve and disobey God. And that was a sin. When he made that choice, when he determined he was going to do that, that was a trespass. He knew he wasn't supposed to do, even determined to do that. And he chose to. If I remember, that's in 2 Timothy. No, 1 Timothy 2. That is a 1 Timothy. Okay. Um, oh, there's my second, because it's 1 Timothy 2. Because uh, it talks about the two woman. 2.14. Yeah, so uh, 1 Timothy 2.14, where it says that Adam was not deceived, uh, was not, um, this is your word, uh, he wasn't caused to wander, but the woman was uh, thoroughly deceived. It talks about that. Uh, we have a slight textual issue there, but the concept is more of taking that same word that Adam was not deceived, and it's emphasizing it quite a bit. You know, it's like out from deception. She just, she really thought she was doing something that would be good. You know, where Adam looked at it and they know that's bad, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, so he actually sinned. So they, as a result of that, they are kicked out of the garden. Therefore the God, the Lord God, sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the men out, or the man out. And really, um, I don't know if you need to necessarily say he drove the man out, because it actually is the word Adam. It's the Adam. Um, so it probably would be better to translate, and he drove Adam out. You know, um, I can kind of get the uh, understanding where they want to put man there because Eve is included in that. Um, but I don't think you necessarily need to say man. He dro um, drove the he drove Adam out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherub. Or actually, he, he <coughs> stationed a cherub. He, he, chastened, or he stationed multiple cherubs. Um, you know, in your stories you always get the one cherub with the flame, but there, this is actually plural. Um, he actually did that with uh, multiple cherubs are placed there. So apparently, however it was formed, you know, the east of the garden was where the, I don't know if that was where the actual tree was located. Um, this is the area that um, the cherub were actually placed, a flaming sword that turns every direction to guard the way of the tree of life. So, you know, is the, I don't know if the tree is over on the west and this one's on the east. I don't, I mean, we don't get enough detail on that, but we do know that man is not permitted at this point to eat from the tree of life. And it doesn't indicate that the cherub is wielding a sword, it's like they're two separate Yes, it does actually seem to indicate that, uh, um, however, uh, a flame of sword, it says uh, here it uses a, a preposition that is with, 
and they leave that out in our translation. So it would be he, he stationed the cherub beam and with a flaming sword turning every direction. But we don't, we don't actually pick that up in our English translations. So yeah, more than likely it wasn't just a sword with no nothing, you know. Um, interesting concept though, I mean, you know, again, do we have a sword at this point? I don't know. You know, was, uh, did Adam have the knowledge of working with metals? Um, well, again, we don't know. I do, we get a hint of it that they did have that knowledge. Because here, um, in the, the second dispensation, we're going to see that one of them becomes the father of, uh, was it brass? And, uh, we'll get to that. It was, uh, tin and brass or, um, something along those lines. Uh, I did say earlier to cultivate the garden, so, well. Yeah, he was to cultivate the garden. What was he going to cultivate it with? A stick? Yeah. You can cultivate with a stick, you know, a hardwood stick. You can. Especially if the... But a whole lot better with a piece of metal. It's a lot easier to cut that stick. Yeah, you know, so, so, you know. Well, yeah, and you kind of wonder because here there's a reference with a sword. How would you know to be afraid of a sword? Yeah, yeah. You know, if, never, if you've never sword. got the concept of oh, that thing sharpened could probably you know do some damage. Yeah. Was this for Adam and Eve? Uh, Maybe it's for other spirit Yeah, it, it's very interesting that cherubs are used here. That's very significant, actually, because remember when we look at the uh, order of the of the spirit beings, cherubs are the highest. Uh, seraphim have a specific position within the temple and dealing with the temple. Um, we have one archangel, and then we have the cherubs that are above all of the angels. And when it comes to angels, what do they do when they encounter one who is of a higher rank or created in the creation scale is higher than they? They do not, like humans do, they will not challenge the authority. Yep. So basically, this is an element of authority saying, you know, that Satan's little whatever, you're not going to let man. He's not going to let us live in this condition forever. Uh, first kind of hint that he's going to uh, provide... No one or nothing It's going to get to, the, yeah. get to that tree. Yeah, that's, that tree was sealed, period. Uh, but he did permit it to, at this point, to stay on the earth. Um, later he actually moves it. But here over in Genesis chapter 3 and verse uh, 17, we have the fact that the earth is cursed. Um, and Adam, and then to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from this tree. Cursed is the ground because of you. In your toil you will eat it all the days of your life. Uh, so here, of course, would give us an indication that for providing, for getting food, Adam did not have to work hard to get food. Because uh, here it's indicating he's going to have to really work for it to eat. Where before, apparently, you work hard, you get all sweaty, and then you go pick something and eat it. I don't know, dinner's ready already. You know, I mean, it's just the indication is because he now all of a sudden has to do it. He has this hard labor work. That's your toil term. He had to work for it. Um, he's going to have to... Which we all know that, because we inherited that earth. And we know if you want good, uh, good fruits and vegetables, you got to work that ground. Um, the harder you work it, sometimes the better. Not always, though. So. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but anyway, so we have, uh, it's cursed. It's not going to produce its full anymore for man. It's going to, um, it's going to be reduced. Uh, then we have thorns and thistles that grow and eat the plant. And uh, But here, of course, they're still going to eat the plants. So they're, they're still um, vegetarians. They're not um, given permission to eat animals. Uh, we do have, now we don't see it here, but again back over in Romans chapter 17, 5 verse 17, we actually do have the statement that 
man immediately spiritually died. And there is significance to that because we are now separated from God in our spirit. That's our rational part. There's an immediate separation. That is significant to understand too because this is prior to any children being born to them. And when the children are born to them, we are born in Adam's image. Uh, in the days that man was created in his likeness, he made them male and female. Adam lived 130 years and he became the father of a son in his likeness according to his image. And those likenesses and images are very important to understand because uh, the likeness has the concept of being intelligent. Being an int one who is in similar in that sense. Image has the idea of, well, what image were we in if we're in the image of God? That actually also gives us an understanding of what was stripped. The light. Light. Now, now, Adam and Eve were stripped. And it does use that word, by the way. Um, they were, it, uh, it talks about... I think they, uh, the translation, it says, here they were naked. Um, let me make sure. Oh, and they knew that they were naked. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7 there. Um, and then this particular word, in this particular form of it, uh, when you go and you look at it, um, it's not used very often. It is not the word that's necessarily used. Um, it's not talking about not having any clothes on, like, you know, they just suddenly realized, hey, we're both naked, as if they didn't know that before. You know, I mean, there would have been the something happened to where they lost something. And this uh, form, this Hebrew form, does have the idea of being stripped. You're naked, you were lacking. Yeah, you all of a sudden don't have a covering. Well, we know that they were um, over in Genesis uh, here. Uh, let me see. See here, they're they're sewing fig trees together. Um, let's see if I can show this. Because over in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 25, it says that they were naked. And they were both naked and they were not ashamed. Uh, the male and the female. Um, this uses a, um, it's kind of hard to pick up here between the two. Because um, I don't have a good way to show these. Um, but the particular form of this one is different. And you could see that when I looked up this particular word, Genesis chapter 2 doesn't come up. Because it's a different form. It's in a, it's in a different form, meaning they were stripped. And that would be a better way of actually translating this. It's not they were naked, but they were stripped. Because um, over in Genesis chapter 2, it does say that you know they didn't have clothing on. They didn't have uh, plants that they put over them or animal skin would be the indication there. They didn't have, but they still had a covering because over here they're stripped. So they lost that light. Um, well, of course, we get Adam's image and therefore we do not have that image of light anymore. But we still have that likeness because Adam is still intelligent. In Genesis chapter 5 and verse 3, Adam did not suddenly become a stupid man. He did that in chapter 3. Um, so, I mean, here, you know, it's not an indication that, um, and we do from, from the rest of the scripture, man still has intelligence, but we've also lost that connection with God. And we're going to see, too, without that connection, we are going to go down pretty quickly in the wrong path. Um, so they're stripped of their garment of light. Uh, they're subject to physical death. Genesis chapter 3, verse 19 talks about that. And Romans chapter 5, verse 12. And then um, 
for the woman over in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16, she is, uh, I will uh, greatly multiply your pain in childbirth, and pain you will bring forth a child, yet your desire will be unto your husband, and he will rule over you. And this is a, this is a very interesting passage um, in the way that it's, uh, to go into this and understand this because there's something that happens that changes um, this is God is punishing her now you here of course you go here you got the focus of there's pain in childbirth but what else does he say there's two other things that he's talking about here that she is going to have to deal with one of them is her desire is going to be unto her husband and then the other is he is going to rule over her. So if he is going to rule over her, the indication would be he wasn't ruling over her before this. Otherwise, why would it be a penalty? Um, they were equal in the garden. Co-regents. Yeah. But here, that has changed. And then, of course, there's going to be the desire unto him, uh, that longing that she is going to have, uh, which of course would involve having that head over her. Uh, this word longing, I've heard some indications of what this is, um, and I would say it's, I haven't fully investigated this word, but there's in, um, I've heard some people in, try to indicate, because over here in Solomon you get that also, or the Song of Solomon. Um, where they're trying to indicate that it's a sexual desire. I think that's kind of a little weak, actually. Because here he says, my, uh, I am my beloved and, her, and his desire is for me. And the indication of the poem. Um, and it uses the same word. By the way, this particular form isn't used very much. You only have it, well, three occurrences in this particular form. So, so that's not the same word that's used... Um, when um, Cain sinned, and uh, it says something about the sin. And it's in the sin nature, its desire is unto yeah. you. Um, he did that over in. Oh, no, I went too far. I want four. Yeah. This four is where we. Because uh, here he's a vagabond. What have we done? Seventeen. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say I went. I went the wrong way. Yep. Um, no, I went too far. Yeah, it's right in here. You should find and slay. Oh, actually, it's the. Uh, if I put it here. Yeah, it's the only one that I've actually translated in here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> this is chapter four, verse seven. 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 So, yeah, it goes all yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, this is your word desire here, which is a different form. Let me see. Is that... This is your longing, which is a ta sham, and I don't actually have it up there. So I'll have to go over here and look at it. That's my naked term. That's not, my other. That's not the right one. Um, it's got the same root, but a different form. Um, so, like I said, um, I wouldn't take it that way. However, I would take it that in the instructions, she is going to have a desire for him, and then he is going to rule over her. So there is a change in that, um, in that position. Does that, does that imply that there was no desire prior to that, or...? There was no need for a desire? Um, probably no need for the desire, yeah. um, more than likely. Not saying that there wasn't a desire or not, it's just here it's, it's attached with and he's going to rule over you. And now, of course, if one is going to rule over another, you know, it, if there's going to be a struggle, there would be a struggle there. She's like, no, you're not. <laughs> you <know? laughs> uh, so there would be a desire to that in that tent. And I think that's more of where the context is actually focusing on it, is she is now going to be ruled over um, rather than being his um, 
equal in, in, in this case in ruling. Uh, she's still his helpmeet. She's still not underneath him. Um, but there is going to be, he's going to be the head. And that is your word mashal, which is your normal word for to rule. Uh, marshal, ma, the, the martial term mashal, if you remember that from Hebrew. Um, yeah. He's going to rule in that sense. He's going to be over her. Um, so, of course, our dispensation ends here. Our first dispensation ends. It does end very catastrophically. You know, I mean, it kind of, you know, when you're reading the story, if you just, especially in some of our translations, if you read it, it's like, eh, they got kicked out of the garden, you know, and, and it's, but actually, they were separated in their spirits from God. They're subject to a physical death. They now have to work hard for their food, you know, and their, posi their position it has changed. Uh, the relationship between the two has actually changed because of this. So this is a very catastrophic end to the dispensation of innocence. You know, even though it's not like the earth was being ripped up and mountains were, you know, forming and stuff like that, that's later, you know. Um, and that was because we refused to actually do what God said and spread across the earth. So he said, fine, I'm going to put a big old mountain between you and you now you have to move. Um, and we have those today. And they were quite effective. So, but that, of course, is for another dispensation. This particular, the next dispensation, um, it, we run into that one really starting here in uh, Genesis chapter, um, well, really, it starts right after um, chapter 3, because 3 is uh, really the end of it. So chapter 4, we now have Cain. We have talked about this before. There's good reference here, um, especially with Genesis chapter 1, verse 4. Um, the way that uh, Eve responds to God does indicate here that Eve is actually saved. Um, and the reason I say that is because salvation is by faith, and she is expressing faith in a promise from God. Because remember, God gave them a promise that the, that the seed of the woman would crush the head of Satan, or in this case, the serpent. Now, she took that, and here we don't see it very well in our translations, because it's saying that Adam knew, his, uh, knew Eve, his wife, and if you don't know what new means, because, you know, the scripture is not saying he had sex with his wife, it, this knowing term, there's significance in that in understanding what's going on, by the way, in later passages. That's how it was referenced. Oh, he had relations with. That's your word, yada, no. So the, actually the, uh, the King James is better. She conceived and bore Cain, and she said, I have gotten, but this word gotten here is a word that comes from a uh, Hebrew word, kanak, which means to acquire or purchase. Not to... Uh, it's not, I've received, or, um, I don't know what the concept of gotten, gotten kind of sounds funny, actually, if you really think about it. How do you, how does she say, I got, I went and got a man? Uh, it's just really, if you look at the, the English there, I've gotten a man from the Lord? Did he bring, you know, I mean, we, we under, we put it as, oh, well, she's talking about a male being born. But actually, they're using the word gotten here because this isn't actually, I have received a man from the Lord. Uh, there, there's a purchased one who is for redeeming. Um, that's actually, and you don't quite pick that up in our English. She believed Cain was the one who was going to redeem them. He was the one who was here to um, take care of the situation that they had gotten themselves into. That is not, by the way, unfounded because they hadn't had children at the, up to this point. She has a child. She has a male. She's a very intelligent person, by the way, because so is Adam. They're both very intelligent. Logically, the revelation she has is God just said, the seed of a woman is actually going to do this. And she's like, this human being comes out of her and she's like, that's my seed. That's, this is, you know, made no total sense. 
uh, we do not get that indication from Adam. You know, and I know there are some people who want to say that Adam is saved. I don't see that in Scripture. But I'm also not saying he wasn't, because I don't see that directly, although I would lean more towards he wasn't. Why? We're either in Adam yeah. or we're in Christ. You know, how can we be in Adam if Adam is a saved person? That doesn't make sense to me. Um, he's the first Adam, you know. But when we get to heaven, we're going to know. <laughs> Simple as that, because Scripture doesn't really give us enough information on that. Um, and I don't think it's outside of God's capability to to make something like that happen to actually bring him to salvation, but I don't know. All I do know from Scripture is we have an indication that Eve actually is saved at this point. And that, of course, involves the promise when it comes to salvation, because the object of their salvation does involve faith in Christ, or excuse me, in God. They don't know about Christ at this point. Um, and it's the same for all of us, you know, I mean, how is a Christian, how is a person saved today? A Christian can't be saved, a Christian is saved. I was going to say Christian, but yeah, you know. We believe God, that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again. That's what we believe, that's what he said. That's what we believe. What about in the dispensation of law? Did they have to believe that they were going to crucify Christ? and that he was going to be raised, they didn't even know that that was going to happen. They had to believe that God was in the God, temple. God was... You know, they had to take him at his word. So it's the same concept here. So coming into now the dispensation of conscience, we also see here, by the way, Adam is not given instructions at this point. So this is where our understanding also, it helps to develop our understanding in the fact that the steward, once they lose their position, even if they're alive in the next dispensation, they're not given the position of a steward again. Because if that was the case, Adam would have been given instructions on what he was supposed to do. I mean, it's logical. He was given instructions in the garden. Um, and it's not, it's not like uh, God is just uh, letting them go around without any concept at all. Uh, we do have a period of time, by the way, where, and this happens by, with dispensations, where we don't really have a, a dispensation specifically. And what I mean by that is, a lot of times during the, um, we could call it transition period, but really it's the time of judgment. You're not really in a dispensation. You know, when, when Adam and Eve were judged, were they still in the dispensation of innocence? Were they still under that law? Well, they had broken the law. They had failed. So they couldn't go back and say, well, we're not going to eat of that tree anymore. It wouldn't do any good. You know, it's already failed. So that you have that short period of time where there isn't a direct, or revelation hasn't been specifically given. And we see that quite a bit in the uh, dispensation. I mean, we, you look with uh, Noah, you know, I mean, how long was it before Noah actually was given instructions? You know, it wasn't long after the flood, but he, he was, God talked to him many years before the flood. He builds the ark. He's a, he's a preacher of righteousness, but he's not given instructions. Then we have the whole entire world is wiped out. And then after God, you know, they kind of set up camp again, so to speak. They're setting up their homes, and then they're given instructions, and, and it's specifically given to Noah. Noah and his sons, but Noah being the head as we looked at that. So, as we're moving down here, uh, we do see uh, the, the, the situation that really brought up the sin nature. Um, we don't see a lot of, uh, we don't have all of the information here, by the way, and um, we definitely should add some more in here because there's other passages of Scripture that deal with this. And it's going to be, uh, you know, I have some of these in the notes, especially when we get into 1 John and John. 
because it talks about what's going on here that we're not seeing again in the Hebrew. Um, yeah, under second dispensation conscience, um, under the little the little bitty eye, knowing good and evil, man is to do good and rule over sin. Should that be sin nature? He's to rule over his. A good question. Now, I think it really is referencing not doing wrong sin, not specifically the sin nature. Because man doesn't really have a good understanding of his sin nature at this point. Um, Cain really, you know, I mean, he, he talks about it in a way where he says, my perversity. When did we actually really, as humans, understand our sin nature? That we have a sin nature? Aww. It was law that really exposed that. So, I mean, he knows he has a part of him that's very, and like I said, the way that he describes it is it's perverted. It's, it's a perverse. And he describes that here in, in 7. Actually, it's a little bit farther down because God, God gives him instructions here and then he goes and kills his brother. Um, and then when he is punished, um, Remember that this is not my punishment is too great to bear in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 13. This word punishment is not punishment. It's, uh, it's um, I own, which means perversity. So he understands he has a part of him that wants to do that wickedness. And he's to rule over that. So I think the focus is more he should not have done that. And he knew. I mean, he should have been able to control. Well, that sort of implies there's, there's some standard or something. I mean, we're not told that anything after. I mean, yes. The only law we're given so far, right, was was that don't eat of the tree. I mean, mm -hmm. until until now this statement. So I mean, but if he knew his nature was perverse, there had to be some. Yeah. Something to measure it against, if you will. Well, man now has the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. So man has the knowledge of knowing what is beneficial and what is not. Though that's not a specific rule that says, now you must go know what is good and evil. Man knows it. He has a conscience yes. now. Yeah. You know, and that's where it's saying, hey, what you're doing, you know that's not right. That is not just what you're doing. Not he, you know, yeah. Yeah. You know, um, he's going to kill his brother out of anger. And, and, of course, we know from other passages it wasn't just about he bashed his brother's head in and he got angry. You know, I heard somebody talk. Oh, yeah, the, the son, there was the billboard where it says, you know, the first murder weapon was a rock or something with Adam. Oh. And I'm like, no, it was a very sharp blade. Yeah. Uh, because we find out later he actually sacrificed his brother. Now, he did that. And now, we also know in, in 1 John, he was being manipulated by Satan, who brought this about to begin with. And could you, I mean, some of the things, you know, that will be interesting to see if we find out. The reaction of Satan when he lit that match and what happened. Now, he knows man has a sin nature. He's probably, with these kids growing up, He's probably figured out, hey, I can do this and they react in this way. So, you know, I'm going to get Cain to reject God completely. And more than likely it was malicious, because if he rejects God completely, maybe this time God will wipe man out and I can have my, my kingdom back. You know, he doesn't necessarily have a fondness. Or maybe I want to rule over God's creation at this point. They're, they're on my king, in my land, is the way he thinks about it, you know. But when he lit that match, I don't think he expected the explosion he got. And the reason I say that is, afterwards, what does he do? He designs a system to control that sin nature. Because I think he was even saying, man, that was not right. I don't, I don't know, we, we just... You went the wrong direction. That was not where we were wanting to go. Even I didn't think about it. Yeah, he's like, no, no. You totally missed the point. Um, so he sacrifices that. So, you know, all of that to basically say, yes, I think it would be better to say sin. 
rather than sin nature at this point, because they don't really have a good knowledge of the sin nature. Other than it, there is this level of perversity that they have, and they also have a knowledge of good and evil. But for some reason, he wants to do these, this evil, this perversity that he's talking about here. He didn't have a he didn't have a problem with God's punishment in that sense. You know, I mean, where the way that our translations make it sound, mm -hmm. it's like you know he's saying, "Oh, it's just too hard for me to leave my family," because that's really what. Uh, or maybe with Cain, it was that the earth wasn't going to produce for him anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And since the, the sin nature was relatively new, that it was probably very distinct as to what was right and what was wrong. Yeah, at this point, I think, uh, you know, man had a good knowledge of good and evil, and but we don't really have, like you said, we don't have a big development yet of the sin nature. It hasn't really encountered a lot of different circumstances. Not like 6,000 years mm -hmm. later, it's so refined. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, it definitely expresses itself in a whole lot of different ways um, the, now than it used to. Um, sadly, of course, the end result of this, which we will uh, have to get to next week, um, as we move on down near the end result of this, um, mankind gets to the point to where every thought, every, not every thought, it's every formation, every thing that he creates within his imagination is evil. So he goes from Cain struggling with the recognition that he has a, a perversity that wants to do this evil to only thinking of creating their whole process in their mind was about evil, about doing things that are bad. So it didn't take the sin nature very long. To, you know, how, how many years is this? I think this was... Uh, I have to go back and look at this, but I think it was a few thousand years, if I about recall. About 2,000, I think. Yeah, I think it was about 2,000 years. Um, generally speaking, because with the timeline of the ages we get yeah. in that area. So, so with that... Uh, Basically have Adam and then Methuselah, they were both 900 plus years. <laughs> yes, so we're it's getting... Roughly 2,000. It's, uh, yeah, it's right in the roughly 2,000 year mark. Um, and as I've said with the garden, we don't actually know how long it is and there's questions, but I take it as when it says that Adam was 130 years when he uh, had That's his first, Seth. had Seth, that um, <clears throat> that is actually his age and not his age from when the uh, punishment came. One, some want to say, well, you know, um, from the punishment, that's when God started counting years. But actually, when did God create time? He didn't create it after the punishment. One of the first six days. Ago. Yeah, that was like, four. yeah, that was really early in the, in the process. So time had already been created. So the counting of years and seasons, that was already in place. So more than likely, giving age and other things along those lines, it probably was about a hundred years in the garden. Uh, and that gives about 30 years for Cain and then the, him growing up. I, we don't know how old Cain was at this point when he did this. There isn't a reference. Um, I don't think they were in the garden for very long, though. You know, it would have been a pretty awesome hundred years, though. Um, but, um, because it doesn't go back to say that Adam was thousands and thousands of years old. It just wouldn't make sense at this point. And, but anyway, um, 2,000 years later, and well, man is going to, God is going to wipe man from the earth because of how wicked he becomes, which is quite sad. But he's going to keep his promise that he made to Eve. And Adam and Eve, in the beginning, is going to keep his promise because he's going to save one man and his family. So he's going to keep that promise. So let's go ahead and close.